In the first session, we considered how liquid love never remains. We saw the selfish triangle. We saw how the interests of men and women have been progressively reduced to focus mainly on myself and my feelings. And now we will consider the biblical answer. The Word of God always gives us words of health and restoration. Solid love never fails. And this is a direct quotation from Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Sorry, verse 7. Love never fails. Love never fails. In contrast to the liquid love, which depends almost totally on feelings, solid love can be compared to a building. And this is the second metaphor I will give you, I will leave with you this morning. So from my talk, you will only need to remember a triangle and a building, that's all. If you remember the triangle and the building, you may forget the rest. I hope you remember the triangle. Now you imagine a house, We'll do a very simple house like children's. Now, a house that has three parts. A house needs a firm foundation. A house needs a solid structure, the walls, the main walls especially. And finally, if you live in the house, it needs a good maintenance. You have to keep the house in good shape, maintenance. Now, let's consider these three elements in the building of solid love. As I said, solid love can be compared to a building. Its construction requires three main elements. A solid foundation, a strong structure, and a good maintenance. First of all, a solid foundation. Solid love is a covenant. It's expressed as a covenant. Richard, yesterday evening, was talking about this, and he said that how in Genesis 2.24, leaving, cleaving, and becoming one flesh are strong words very strong words because they are words that belong to a covenant, covenant language. There is a steady rock. Notice the contrast with the liquid love. There is a steady rock upon which the building of solid love is built. The commitment that comes from, the commitment stemming from a covenant Loving is much more than a feeling. Loving clings to and rests upon a decision. Its stability cannot depend upon emotions and feelings because these are changing all the time. The commitment which stems from a covenant is the anchor, the foundation, the anchor that helps the boat not to shipwreck when the storm comes. It's the guarantee of stability 
in the middle of conflict and crisis, a solid foundation in times of a storm. A covenant is the main safeguard of every relationship, but in marriage it acquires a special meaning. Marriage, in God's eyes, is not a simple agreement between two persons. A simple agreement that can be finished in a light way. In God's eyes, the covenant of marriage is a fundamental covenant. I think this is the reason why God time and again compares his relationship to the people of Israel and to us as a marriage relationship. There is a covenant. A covenant cannot be broken easily. A covenant has a price. Today people do not marry. At least in some countries they marry very little. And surprisingly enough, when they marry, they marry, they choose as a place to marry the most strange places. They marry in very unusual places. Have you noticed that? When I was young, 40 years ago, people, most of them, married in church. Now they marry anywhere. Anywhere. On the beach, on a boat, in a restaurant, anywhere goes. I think this is an expression of the make the, the, the fact that the covenant is being made light, 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 every time is being lighter. I think it is not by chance that when the covenant is broken, God says that his eyes are filled with tears. You remember mentioning one case of divorce in Malachi? My eyes are full of tears. Divorce is always painful. And there is an emotional explanation apart from all the spiritual reasons why it is so painful that has to do with this covenant language. The verb cleave, shall man leave his family and cleave to his wife, is the same verb as to, clue, to glue. You glue two papers, okay, like this. You glue, cleave, and if you eventually want to separate these two papers, what will happen? One part of this paper will remain forever here, and one part of this paper will remain forever in the other part. This is why cleaving is so deep, so meaningful, that it requires a high price. It's very expensive when you want to separate. So a covenant, it's not a light agreement, but a deep commitment, strong bond. Now, secondly, a solid structure. Yesterday, we started saying something about this. If the foundation is expressed in a covenant that leads to faithfulness, being faithful, the solid structure is expressed in closeness. Closeness. As we said yesterday, 
intimacy. We are inside the house now. We move from the foundation to the inside. If you want a cozy house, if you want to be well in the house, you need the right temperature. You don't want to be cold. You don't want to be warm either. You don't want to be cold. You need nearness, closeness. Intimacy is to a couple what oxygen is to the lungs. I paraphrase a sentence of Emil Brunner, the Protestant theologian Emil Brunner said this regarding hope. And I uh, take this sentence and apply it to closeness. Closeness, intimacy, is to a couple what oxygen is to the lungs. Now, intimacy, as Richard also said yesterday, is closeness at all levels. To become one flesh is not just about sexuality, but about empathy. Becoming one flesh means penetrating the soul of the loved one. There is a penetration which, much, which is much more important than the physical penetration. And it is a penetration of the soul. Actually, when you are able to penetrate the soul of your spouse with your empathy, sexuality comes almost in a natural way. Most sexual dysfunctions, experts say, most sexual dysfunctions have to do with the lack of real love in the couple. The best aphrodisiac, you have this word in, in English? Aphrodisiac. The best aphrodisiac, the substance to stimulate sexual desire, when patients ask me, could you please recommend me something to stimulate my libido, my sexual desire? I say, yes, a very old one and very, very efficient, very powerful love. Love is the most powerful. Love is the best Viagra with no side effects. Viagra has side effects. Love is the most powerful Viagra. And love means penetrating the soul before penetrating the body. When you have previously penetrated the soul, it's much easier. Sexuality comes in a natural way. Human sexuality is a reunion, is an encounter, a deep encounter between two people. It's much more than just joining two bodies. Intimacy, closeness, the solid structures exclude parallel lives. <laughs> Time magazine, some years ago, made a report on a trendy way of couples, for couples to live, which is called living apart together, L-A-T. Living apart together means that one lives in Los Angeles and the other one in New York and they meet once a month and they are together, living apart together. This is an extraordinary expression of what we said a minute ago, the liquid love. Well, sometimes for a short period, there can be a need to live apart together. But living apart together, the L-A-T modality of marriage is not a healthy structure because it requires closeness. Intimacy excludes parallel lives. Now, a good maintenance. Love is expressed also in reconciliation and forgiveness. Closeness was the key word here in the structure. Faithfulness 
is the key word in the foundation. Forgiveness is the key word here. Three parts of the house, three great needs in each one. Faithfulness, closeness, intimacy, and forgiveness. Every building must have an adequate upkeep. Restoration can fix cracks and crevices when they come up. The same thing happens with the building of love. The process of dealing with conflict must be done in the right way so that reconciliation and restoration happens. Let me, I think I have five minutes, haven't I? I have five minutes. In five minutes, I would like to just summarize what I like to call the toxic effects of anger. The toxic effects of anger. Anger has three stages. It's a poison that has three stages. Stage number one. Anger in itself is not sin. Anger is a reaction. Anger can even sometimes be holy, an expression of being righteous. God is holy and he is angry. And Paul says, be angry, but do not sin. So there is a possibility to be angry and yet without sinning. When does anger become a sin? When you let the sun go down while you are still angry. Ephesians, do you remember that? Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Because if anger is just a reaction and therefore it's not a sin, if you go to bed angry, then it's not a reaction, but it's an attitude. The attitude that we call resentment. And resentment, the attitude, is dangerous because if you don't work properly with this attitude, the great danger is that it grows and grows and grows. And it's like a tree that makes roots in your heart. And when resentment, anger turned into resentment makes roots in your heart, then it leads to a sin and this is certainly a sin, which is bitterness. Bitterness is the third and final step of anger. The Apostle Paul says that bitterness, the root of bitterness, you remember Paul says, any root of bitterness quenches the Holy Spirit. So, whereas anger in itself is not a sin, bitterness can indeed be a sin, and we have to struggle against it. So, reconciliation and forgiveness are the maintenance, the proper maintenance of the building. I need to close. We have to close. I would like to summarize in three sentences three practical pieces of advice, three seeds that you can plant in the garden of your marriage that have helped me most in my personal life and in my professional life. So if you ask me the one million question, if you had half second, a uh, uh, half minute to give me a piece of advice regarding my marriage, what would you say? Here it comes. One. Give to your spouse as much as possible. Give as much as possible. 
second, think of her or him as good as possible. Philippians 4, 8. Give to her or to him as much as possible. Think of him or her as good as possible. Philippians 4, 8. And pray for him or her as often as possible. Self-giving, agape love. The right attitude, the right mind, Philippians 4, 8, taking captive every thought to Christ, right thinking, and the power of prayer make a wonderful background for a healthy marriage. May God bless you to have solid houses with a good foundation, a solid structure, and a good maintenance. God bless you.